So uh, this isn't really precisely talk either. I don't even have slides this time, and I have this website here. So uh, um, this talk or this session is supposed to do be two things. Like first of all, I would like to make everyone aware that this page here exists. And uh, um, after everybody's aware of this, um, I'd like to uh, uh, maybe discuss a couple of the things listed here in a little bit more detail. So um, yeah, the first thing, yeah, we have this website. Um, it uh, has been created like a couple of years ago, I guess, by uh, people who do like uh, basic user space uh, operating system design, like systemd and similar projects. And sorry, um, Leonard, um, link is in the chat for people who want to get this later. Yeah, the link is somewhere in the chat. I don't see that, oh, though. Over there. Oh, there, yeah, over there. So uh, um, uh, uh, so it's all by low-level user space people who, and it's generally focused on core kernel features, like not driver stuff or something, but core kernel features. And it's basically a wish list of all the uh, things we would like, eventually, the kernel to provide to us. Um, it's mostly about missing functionality to close a couple of gaps to make the APIs that we currently have uh, really well uh, work well for us. So uh, actually, a couple of the things that were um, talked about uh, in this MC were already on there, like, for example, the C group related um, uh, PIDFD stuff that we just heard about. A root of S mount uh, I put on there as well, like a yeah. long time ago. And uh, like, if we scroll, like at the top, it's all the items that uh, we would still like uh, uh, to have implemented. And if you scroll, ooh, why is it zooming? Does it work? Uh, no. It's zoomed. Anyway, so if you. Roll down and actually has a list of the things that were actually already implemented, um, thankfully, uh, uh, for us. I think many of these things are actually not that hard to implement. Um, so uh, um, for, I don't know, people who actually want to become new kernel hackers, um, they probably uh, um, uh, might even be, a couple of them are relatively easy to implement and uh, might get you started. Um, How is scrolling here? It's, it's working. Um, yes, in the chat, you can look at all of the uh, for notify and notify things. So as you see, there are quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so here, this is the territory, basically. Um, this is the territory, basically, where we already got what we wanted. And we usually put the hash, uh, the, the commit hash uh, there that actually addressed this for us. Um, uh, all of these th things in the list basically also come with a uh, use case, which I guess is the important part, um, so that you actually know why you, uh, uh, we want this. Um, uh, uh, we make suggestions sometimes how this should be implemented, but of course, we, we, this is just suggestions. Whoever implements it, of course, uh, gets to decide how to actually do this. Um, yeah, it would be great for like kernel developers who want to do favors to us user space people to look at this from time to time. We'd be very thankful uh, uh, for anything that is removed from that list. Um, anyone has any questions at this point? Because also, ah, by the way, if you want your own shit to be added there, um, it's, it's, uh, there's a GitHub, um, like collaborate and GitHub uh, thing. If you click on that, you can send us a PR. It's just a markdown file, ultimately. Um, if your feature request touches something that is not core kernel stuff, it's probably not the right place. Um, but if you want something, I don't know, in the file system, uh, APIs, and, and things like that, uh, then this is certainly the right place, I think. Um, yeah, like the pivot root stuff, for example, is also listed here that we talked about earlier. So if nobody has a question. Uh, that's something else, though. At this time, I would go to the top. Where the fuck is the page up? <laughs> we actually have to. OK, because. I should also point out there are some really bad ideas on there. Like I, I, <laughs> I, ideas like you, you stand in the shower and you're like, this is a really smart idea. And then you make a pull request and you realize it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, for example, there's like there there there's uh, there's one item about uh, extending open tree. So one of the problems that we have for 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 um, system D is that uh, we have a feature or a, that is called ID map mounts, where you can change the uh, the ownerships of all uh, files and directories uh, beneath a certain mount point, um, and uh, we need a way to update this, uh, to update the ownership uh, or, or change it. 
And that's, that, that's sort of tricky because like, uh, first of all, we don't want any performance regressions. And second of all, I, I don't want to mess around with like uh, doing RCU protection for uh, additional properties on mounts. So we need a way to change this. And I have multiple ideas. And like, th this is one of the worst ideas that I ever had that I put on there. <laughs> Uh, out of the long list ideas that I had, so it's 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 also at, a, at the beginning, like you know, it's, it's just not all items are like read through it and do it. <laughs> um, yeah, if nobody has anything else to say at this point, I would just probably go through the list a little bit. Um, the first item here is actually. Uh, yeah, this was, would be incredibly useful. Um, uh, just that when you generically mount some some file system, that you can specify a, a sub path, if you so will, and the mount options, so that the the stuff that you actually get mounted is already somewhere below the tree of the file system you're mounting. Um, this would have users, for example, in, in systemd homed, for example, because we set up a mount. Um, like we have a file system for each uh, user, and we actually want to mount a subdirectory of it um, to slash home username eventually. Um, right now we can work around this by doing uh, file system namespaces, but this is really involved, right? Like because we need to create a file system namespace, then mount the file system into it, um, then uh, do a bind mount of only the relevant part outside uh, of the mount namespace uh, um, uh, thing again, and then kill the mount namespace. So you need to fork, you need to mount namespace. I don't know. It's, uh, it's doable, but it's messy, and we'd rather not do this. Um, uh, uh, um, and it's particularly not easy to do it properly because you don't want to generate mount events on the on the um, outer side that, that that aren't there. Interestingly, Butterfest or something has something like that because you can yeah. specify subval equals on the on the on the mount options, and well, you can specify. But it's a special case. Um, it's file system specific. That's sort of the that's sort of the thing. So the, you have to call into the file system to actually do this uh, for Butterfest. But uh, um, I I. Uh, I have a patch series that, that allows you to do this uh, now um, that I just didn't get around to sending. And it, it's essentially that it relies on OpenTree. Um, and OpenTree creates a detached mount that hasn't been attached anywhere in the file system, it allows you to create a detached mount that hasn't been attached anywhere in the file system. So it's a private FD that you have. But one of the restrictions that you have is um, you can't create another detached mount from a detached mount. Um, Permission checking is probably one of the uh, one of the biggest concerns there, um, and uh, but I've, I figured out a way of uh, of how to do this uh, safely, um, and so that shouldn't be that far. It basically involves you would create um, an FS mount file descriptor. You would mount your ext4 xfs whatever you have. You have an anonymous file descriptor uh, that refers to a, an, an undetached mount namespace. Uh, or mount tree, and then uh, you can call open tree, open tree clone again, uh, and then look up the, the sub path that you actually want to open, and then you discard the original FS mount file script, and then you have what you want. The difference between the ButterFS case and the, um, the difference with the ButterFS case is that for ButterFS, ButterFS makes it appear like that is actually, actually the root of the file system. So it switches the, it switches the root entry of the file system out. So it, it, it just looks as slash when it's actually a slash sub -deer. Um, and with with that mechanism, we, we don't pretend like this is your new real root. We, you would still see, OK, this is slash sub -deer. Uh like similar you would like you would in a with a bind mount but i think that's that's acceptable and it would be kind of misleading to to make uh, make that pretend like this is the actual root of your uh, file system this i think probably some legacy semantics that butterfs has if you're going to do that let's uh, make sure that we unify the the mount option name because if you, you you don't want different names across file systems, it's already going to be bad it enough with be ButterFS. Butter, ButterFS is different already. So, so this is purely this is purely uh, purely VFS based. Uh, there, yeah, there is no mount option. Nothing. There would be no mount option ideally. Okay. Um, anyone else has anything to say about this one? Otherwise, we just take another one, which is. Uh, 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 one thing that I really would like to have is uh, having, you know, we have SCM uh, 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 peer 
creds to get for like if somebody sends us a AF Unix message that we can get the the U cred stuff and there's also for SL Linux and also for the PIDFD of the peer. Um, it would be really really useful if we could also get the C group ID this way because the C group um, in a way identifies the app what's it, uh, in in this world today because all the apps generally get their own C groups and uh, they have a nice name like a string and there's a really nice hierarchy that basically yeah constructs the whole system. So if we had this um, we could use this for many things. We currently can kind of work around it, but it's awful um, because we now get the PIDFD, and from the PIDFD we can derive the C group ID. But this is ugly for various reasons um, uh, because uh, once the process died, I think that we can't figure out the C group anymore uh, easier. And, yeah, and okay. uh, in particular for logging stuff, there's lots of stuff that just logs and exits. So the basic, for that kind of stuff, we never can figure out the C group ID this way. So I would really like um, if uh, we could add this. I think it would be relatively simple um, uh, to add uh, and wouldn't le even leak any information because the C group ID is kind of um, an opaque thing. Um, and if you want to translate that to a pass, which you can do, you need privileges via name to handle at. Sorry, handle to name, like the name other one. Name to handle at and open by handle at. Open by handle at. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it should be really simple and would be really useful. And uh, oh, like it would also make the policy kit thing that we heard about uh, in the previous thing uh, a lot safer because at that point we could make security decisions not on the like uh, uh, the C group membership of the peer process at the moment we check it, but instead of the moment where it actually made the, the, the bus request, which I think is a major distinction because processes can migrate between C groups, at least in theory. Um, anyway, that would be awesome. I think there's somebody who already started working on this, like the uh, yeah, Alexander. Alexi. Uh, yeah. Alexander. Um, but uh, yeah, I would really love this. I think it would uh, bring us uh, major benefits because suddenly we could turn C groups into this primary concept um, for identifying containers, VMs, uh, uh, apps, um, and everything else, and make so, correct uh, trust decisions. Uh, so on uh, I don't, I don't have that exit path in uh, in mind right now. When you, uh, what do you mean? When a process exits, uh, exits not has been reaped. So it's a zombie. Yeah. Then you can't figure out the C group anymore. Yeah. Probably because in the exit path it yeah. gets rid of the rid of the C group. Okay. But then you But again, I don't want it even from the PID FD. I want it from the message, right? Like because there are two issues that I have right now. One of the issues is that But what if like my point is like what if you receive a message from a process that has already exited? Um I want the C group uh, um, ID at the moment that it sends a message. I don't care about exiting or not. I want them like the for, for, for a security sends you a decision. Oh, this is cooperative. The process sends you a message. The, the 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 process sends me a message, and then I want to derive from that message what was the identity of okay, that yeah, process that at work, that very moment. Because we get that for Ucred and and things like yeah, for the you just, label. You stash it on the sender side. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? It's in the, in the control message, right? Yeah, it's in the control message. Yep. It's in the control message, so you know when, if, if the process exits, you still have the information. So, oh, and uh, one brief thing to mention: this this was proposed before, but um, uh, this at this before time, uh, there were no concept of C group IDs. There were just C group pass, and there was some opposition on the on LKML by certain people uh, that this would leak too much information uh, to the other side uh, about the C group hierarchy. But this issue kind of went away because uh, we don't have to deal with pass anymore. We can now deal with C group IDs, and they do not leak that kind of information. Nothing about the hierarchy and no labeling and nothing. So, uh, and there, as mentioned, there is for translating that into pass, there's still um, privileges required. Um, if no one has a comment on this, um, I would just uh, go for the next one. Now that um, one thing, uh, um, I think this has been discussed as, as well already uh, uh, on LKML. Like one of the use cases of OTEMP file is like this thing that you can robustly, without having to fear for um, leaving around temporary files when the system crashes, um, uh, 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 yeah, that you can install files in some directory. What's missing though, and what I think is actually much more important is then we, that we can use this for updating files, right? Because right now you cannot, because um, there is no replace behavior when you actually link it into a uh, directory. 
Um, I find this really limiting. Um, in systemd, we have code that tries to work around this, um, which basically just creates a, a randomly named den tree for a moment and then renames that to the final destination because renaming an existing den tree into another one uh, that does exist with replacement, um, but uh, it just shortens the window of risk. It doesn't remove it, and I'd really like to see this addressed somehow. I really don't care what the API looks like in the end, if that's a thing added to link add or a thing added to rename add or something like this. I just want it. <laughs> I I would also, uh, like one trick that I mentioned before is now with the new mount API, what you can do if you need uh, private, uh, uh, private temp files, you can create a private detached mount uh, that you keep that only systemd has access to, and then you create all your temporary files in there. You know what I mean? Well, but I mean, I want to create files in Etsy, for example, right? Like an Etsy, I don't know what that is, XT4, right? Um, yeah. I, mean, uh, I think we discussed this at LSF this year, right? I mean, o Omar was, had a, I mean, I think the idea was to use rename at two, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, yeah. and, and with, a, with, a, with a new uh, flag. So, so I think this is, I thought it was. I mean, it's been a while. I have, I have to go back and look at the LOWN article, but, but I think there was a, there was a plan. So okay, this, that's good. And I think Omar, I don't know if Omar is actually working on it, but I think he was had a plan to, to do it. But yeah, it would be so awesome because in system it's one of the most common things we do. Um, anyone else, anything about this? Otherwise, I would just jump to the next one, which is the ability to open uh, uh, regular files only, right? Like, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> that's amazing. It, it does sound easy, right? Like so in, in Linux, uh, when you open something, right, like you can specify this flag O directory, and uh, if you do that, then you get an error back if it's not actually in directory. And it's a great feature. Um, I know why it was added, but it, I would like to have this for regular files because uh, I think uh, for regular files, it matters even even more, right? Like, so why do we want this? Because uh, on Unix, we have all these kinds of inodes, and sometimes some of them behave very weirdly. Like, I for example, uh, um, dev nodes. Uh, like if you have open sure, a, sure, sure. A, a, a device node, um, then it might block on you, right? Um, wouldn't it make more sense? Wouldn't it make more sense instead of having an O flag to extend uh, to extend open at two and have like a basically an is format argument in the struct? Because O flex is always going to be O flex is always going to be contentious. Like having an O flex, yes, it will apply to open and open at two and uh, open at and whatever. But the, at the same time, like that's somebody will say, oh, what about O device node or whatever? Like with, but with open at two, we can just stuff it like in the struct and have like, okay, this is the restriction that you want to have and fine. Yeah. So in generally, uh, I would say again, I don't really care how the API looks like. If I mean, this is a very simple way to express what I mean, I think. Um, in systemd, again, by the way, we have the code like this where we first open the inode with opath um, so that it's not actually open, verify the type, and then turn it and convert it into a proper file, uh, fd via proc cell fd. But of course, it's really involved. And I mean, in my theory, at least, in libraries like yours, for example, this should actually be the way how you always open files, right? Yeah. But this is the, 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 always basically, this means that you have at least three system calls where you traditionally have one, and that is kind of um, annoying to, to, like, because I mean, it's hard enough to use Linux uh, uh, file system APIs properly, like without races and, and things like that, kind of pushing everybody, to, like trying to convince them, oh, please make it all three system calls instead of one is really hard. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, for the, we could extend open out to, I mean, the one thing that I'm wondering, because then you could, if you would make it that it would take the format, then it, you would say, well, it's just the optimization of like, you reduce three syscalls to one, for this particular type of check. The other question is like, presumably there's gonna be, I mean, uh, is there any other things people would want to check against? I mean, like if you want to, if you definitely want to open a particular device, no, you probably want to check that it has the right major minor number or whatever, hypothetically, and stuff like that. Um, but like, I don't well, know. I personally don't care about anything else, right? Um, I okay. only care about the regular files thing as far as I know. I, I wouldn't know. Like device, like if you open a device, that's a really special case, and you go usually by pass, and that's even fine, yeah. right? Um, and device nodes generally don't exist outside of slash dev, and we should enforce that by security policy, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm really not so so concerned about that okay. so much. I'm really concerned about regular files because then you can trick arbitrary applications with this. Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Sorry. There's also resolve cache as well. Do with that. I, I, it's really fishy when you have uh, when you have a block device node on your XFS or ext4 file system. I mean, probably there are some use cases, but in my opinion, yeah, we sh that's something we should have probably not allowed. Was there a comment over there? 
some question. I thought I heard no. Sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, the other thing is that uh, you also need um, you also want to use resolve cached because you uh, it's not just the type of the inner. It's also like if it's on a detached NFS mount, you want to make sure that it doesn't. I mean, but the problem with this resolve cache doesn't help you with that because that will block stuff that is like on a local file system but is not yet in the page cache. Maybe we need to have. I, I suggested this when I did open that too. Is that we maybe would want to have some kind of thing that says uh, don't open. Um, uh, if it's a remote file system or something, or like if it's something where like you could in theory block indefinitely on the open, because like if it's if you have a a stale NFS mount and you give me that file, um, it doesn't matter what the file type it is, it'll still block. You could already stumble upon a problem during path lookup. Uh, right. So it would, it would need to be a resolve. It would need to be a resolve flag. So it would need to leave like so. It'd be like resolve cached, but rather than just being for cached stuff, it would be resolve no remote or resolve no whatever. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I don't think that well the idea of like limiting to regular files firstly solves your uh, issues because uh, well you can get all the kind of issues with, uh, if you have a weird file system as well already not mentioned NFS and secondly it will be limiting because like people often try to provide for example well as I mentioned five files and stuff just to well get. Uh, to work around like existing limitations to like pipe uh, like some information into programs so that will otherwise accept the regular files and it uh, like sounds kind of limiting uh, well, for these use cases to, uh, while not serving well uh, well while not solving the issues of uh, being so, blocked on something. So regular files and directories and symlinks are special because they you can create them. Uh, um, they're actually openable, and you can create them unprivileged, right? That means um, this is different from device nodes, which are privileged to create. This is different from from uh, um, sockets, because you cannot open them, right? So, uh, um, or FIFA say that you are also unprivileged and, and things like that. So uh, I think those are the ones that you need to be careful about, right? Like because uh, people can fuck with you um, by creating a symlink in some shared directory in slash temp or something like this, and 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 and, and give you the wrong idea, right? So um, I don't know. Like I'm not too concerned if the system created a device node in slash dev called foobar. That's fine with me. Um, if if somebody points me to this, what I'm really concerned about is that if I open a pass somewhere else and through some trickery, it ends up uh, 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 there, right? Anyway. So um, the so okay. So first of all. You know, I want to address your your thing about you know do, doing additional system calls is annoying, and that is let's uh, let's not confuse um, uh, just, uh, system calls with APIs um, because there's a lot of functionality that can implement it in, in you know in libc. Um, and doesn't have to have, you know, a kernel, you know, kernel system call which increases the kernel attack surface, and so on, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, so that that's that, that's one thing, and and the um, and the other thing is we have to be a bit careful about cr about creating system policy in. That 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 end up being hard coded into applications, and in particular the mounting remote file systems thing that someone mentioned, um, that is actually a system policy. Uh, when the when the file system is mounted, the the you know the the administrator of the system sh decides whether or not it should be a soft or a hard uh, remote mount. A, hard, a, a soft remote mount will time out and, and return an error. A hard mount is, is there specifically to not do that. Right. Okay, but that's if that's if you're running on like the host system. If you're inside a container, then you can make. I mean, you can create a fuse mount that always blocks and stuff like that, right? Like, I mean. Sure. Let's do one last thing or something. Yeah, Sorry. A question over there. Someone hasn't spoken yet. Uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the no dev mount option. So if your system has no dev on all the mounts, except for a slash dev, 
do you even have this problem at all? Uh, well, you know what I'm concerned about is some links and stuff. Uh, sorry, uh, so the, the concern about the symlinks, right? Like, so that you do, you have a symlink in slash home, and it points to slash dev, and then you bam. So uh, if it would be very very easy if we would just say open o regular, and then it doesn't work. There is no follow. Sorry, there's no no follow. That is true. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, the two things that that uh, Linux currently offers you is to say it must be a di directory, and to say it must not be a symlink. But it, but that doesn't really help you because it only is about the final element of the pass, not of the middle element of the pass, uh, and that yeah. makes it pretty useless. I mean, can you can resolve this. Again? Yeah, it, yeah. I, I still think that it's, it's impossibly it's, hard, especially to use for the <laughs> Linux APIs properly. The the no so, regular yeah. stuff I don't find very uh, I don't find very problematic. This is this is pretty useful, and we have we have O directory, and we 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 have all kinds of like uh, don't resolve this nonsense uh, in all kinds of APIs. We have like uh, don't trigger auto mounts, uh, don't uh, don't call into the server. Uh, for NFS file systems, so that you don't get to hang on statics. Like this is this is already happening because like user space keeps crapping itself all over the place. Um, so, so, do we have any have, time at all? We have uh, five minutes left, um, but we have the room until half one. Sure, let's let's well at least do. So up to you. Oh, I can keep on talking. You can keep on talking. <laughs> I know you can. But according to schedule, you are in five minutes time. Okay, then uh, I'm, I'm talking and you don't listen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so what's what else is here? Yeah. I mean, as long as people are interested, I can just keep yeah, yeah. on talking, right? So uh, one other thing that uh, might be interesting to mention is, uh, you know, what's really weird right now in Linux is the fact that if you send a file descriptor of an AF Unix socket, is that the receiving side cannot turn that off. Um, right, like uh, this is an implicitly always turned on thing that is impossible to, to get out of. Um, and it has really weird semantics because the file descriptors are going to basically installed in your process table. Um, uh, if you want it or not, if you make the mistake of using ref message on an AF Unix socket, um, if somebody sends you this. Um, I think this is a security problem in many ways, right? Um, because file descriptors, not only does it like allow the, some remote site to install file descriptors in your in your uh, process, but also if you actually do handle this, which we try to do in Systemd, for example, then you uh, have to close them, but close is synchronous on Linux, right? Like, so there's very easy ways to create a file descriptor unprivileged that takes 15 seconds or something to close, um, like by using a TCP socket that you bind to some port and then you make one connection and then you close it because of the SO linger thing. <laughs> And it really sucks, and it creates a lot of vulnerabilities. Like, for example, in Dbus, if you send across Dbus and if such a file descriptor, and the receiving side doesn't want it, it will just close call, and bam, Dbus hangs for everybody, right? So this DOS really sucks, and it has been there since about every every time a lot of people know about it, but nobody does something about it. So. Um, I think this specific problem, of course, has two fixes, right? Like, first of all, we should have an asynchronous close where this doesn't happen. But secondly, I think the mistake is already that we ex allowed this to happen in the first place, that uh, some remote site without any further authentication can install file descriptors of their choice into your file descriptor tables. So all I'm asking for is, I mean, we cannot just turn this off uh, uh, by default anymore because then everything will break. But at least we should have a way uh, how we can turn it off uh, explicitly. Okay. Um, we have something similar for this, like for the peer cred stuff that needs to be turned on. It kind of yeah. sucks that we have no API and a similar set sock up for the for that stuff to turn. But shouldn't off. it be possible to have like a receive option where you say like discard any file descriptors that I received and I like, don't you know offload them to a. Uh, that sounds fine thread. to me too, um, uh, but you know, ideally I would like to have something where I can give some other process a file descriptor where the, I don't have to uh, expect the other process to do anything anymore. So I'd really like a property on the file descriptor so that the file descriptor can basically be, be uh, um, considered, um, uh, uh, yeah, never going to install FDs on anyone. Uh, from that point on. That right? would like have to be not... you pass file descriptors through shell pipelines and whatnot, right? It can't be a property of DFD. It must be a property of the file, if at all, I think. Uh, sure, that's what I mean. Yeah, uh, of the file. Yeah. So basically, it should weird. be stored at the same, yeah, um, like, like at the same mm -hmm. place, basically, where the, uh, at the same place where the peer um, uh, creds thing is stored, right? Like, because you can turn that off on a socket, 
and I want to be able to turn it off on a socket that, that this stuff happens. Do you only want to turn it off on a socket? Yeah, I mean, it's a socket uh, thing. The logic being then, if, if someone sends a message with a, with a file uh, to someone else, then we would just discard it. Yeah, which is problematic enough because, again, we cannot... Uh, you want to steal one of the F-mode flags that I freed up with hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and then, but that, that is an instruct file. This should be in the socket thingy. So set socket. Yeah. Yeah, that's what set yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's, yeah. again, that's where the peer cred stuff is. This should be the yeah. same place. And I think it's kind of a mission that after oh, all those years of Linux. You, want, you basically want the socket to, to say, uh, yeah. I don't want to receive yeah, any file ever. scriptors. Ah, OK, I get it. But it's, it's still problematic, right? Like because say, I thought you wanted to if say the, the receiving side. To be sent, yeah. um, uh, I mean, it should be. It should not be discarded on receive. It should probably be. Um, uh, don't even allow it to be sent, because otherwise, because closing is synchronous, you still have the synchronicity problem, right? Um, because I mean, if the receiving side so then automatically like already in kernel discards it. So it's open, but no SCM writes. Yeah, uh, SCM current. Uh, yeah, other SCM writes. Yeah. Anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you want the sender to error out, or would you want like, or would you want it to be that when it sends, it's as if the file descriptors weren't even in the message? Like, which which would I, I, make I more sense? I think it should be an error. I don't know. Like, it okay. should be something that people actually can see. Mm. So, given we are doing for another half hour, I have very sneakily extended your session until the end of the half hour. If you get bored with him blabber, please feel free to leave. <laughs> but so please do go on. I think, I mean, we have so many things on this list. Um, I'm not going to, like, we're not going to go through all of them anyway. Uh, uh, I invite everybody here. This is the URL again. Please have a look. Um, uh, there's lots of interesting stuff uh, uh, there. Um, I think many of these things should be common sense. I, like, for example, that this. In my opinion, it should be common sense that this should be uh, uh, prohibited. Um, uh, 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 yeah, again, I think actually implementing this is probably not the hardest thing in the world um, because there is prior art with the peer creds thing. Um, uh, but who knows what kind of implications this has? Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, do we have the situation where you initially don't want to receive? Uh, file descriptors, but then you yes. authenticate the peer and you want to turn it on? Yes, absolutely. Like in Dbus, for example, Dbus has like these two protocols. Like the first one is the authentication protocol. You do not want to allow FDs there because uh, you don't know anything about the peer and it's an evil peer potentially. But once the authentication took place and you know everything's in order, um, and you do it, um, like it, it even has a has a handshake protocol that figures out if FD passing shall be enabled. After all that passed, yeah, you want to enable that. Mm. So it needs to be uh, uh, to, to, to go. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Sh should we talk about another one, or should we just finish? No, I mean, no, no, no. go on. <laughs> if people are here, they want to hear more. So. Okay. Um, since we're talking about security problems, there's another one. Um, uh, Read-only propagation of mounts. No. So. Um, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> That's not happening. So uh, uh, it would let me let me first like I don't know maybe we have other ideas to address this problem. <laughs> so the, the the thing is like in in uh, uh, in uh, system do we have uh, since quite a while we added the support for sandboxing services, um, and this is implemented via mount namespacing, right? Like so that every service as it starts gets its own mount namespace, and then we basically inherit the host now mount namespace, turn off propagation on pretty much everything. Like propagation from the from the sandbox to the host, but the other direction we leave on, um, and then we replace certain things uh, or change the flags on certain things uh, to read only. Um, this sounds like wonderful sandboxing technology and would have no holes, but it turns out is very very much has holes uh, because uh, yeah, I mean the, the model here is like not disassociate from the from the from the outside world too much, right? Um, and that's why we leave on the propagation from the host into the into the into the sandbox because yeah these services shall not notice that they're actually sandboxed but uh, this all falls flat if people actually mount additional stuff I don't know some USB stick that they mount to run media or something like this because um, these things then get propagated into the sandbox which isn't necessarily the problem but it gets uh, propagated in the sandbox without the read only flag on that it sh that everything else has right so this is a major security hole or, or like omission in our model um, that cannot be reflected what I'd like to see um, 
uh, uh, to fix this would be very simple, right? Like that if pro propagation takes place, uh, um, optionally, uh, uh, the read-only flag, and probably the other flags too, the suit one, no def one, um, uh, 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 should implicitly be added on the propagated uh, uh, version so that you can never propagate a wide open thing into a really closed thing uh, and nobody notices, right? Um, I think, you know, in retrospect, now that we have landlocked... In retrospect, mount propagation was a mistake, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so in retrospect, now that we have landlocked, I think the problem set, the original problem set would have better been solved with landlock because landlock does not create a new world. I mean, there are limitations to this because, for like, for example, we have private TMP, which gives you your own slash TMP that is disconnected from everybody else's. Um, so you could not implement that with landlock. Um, so this problem would still exist to some degree. But I think at least for the read only making of stuff, um, uh, landlock is probably the better solution, right? Like, because it does not rearrange things, because it doesn't in effect um, uh, the hierarchy of things um, and the and the settings of things. Um, all it does is just prohibits the uh, uh, access, and this is kind of what the read-only settings that system view sandboxing are, after all, is about. Um, so I'm kind of tempted to maybe because our knobs are relatively generically name, lay, named, we can probably make it so that we actually do both things, right? Like we install do the mount namespacing because we always had to and because we need to remain compatible, but that we also start to install a, uh, a landlock policy um, then that I think at you, a second level of If you this. can solve this problem, uh, so I, I have a, and I, I mean, I have something against the implementation, but uh, then it's, it's, the mount propagation as it is is already complex, and I really hate the idea of adding some some uh, some magic marker. Probably would have to be some marker on a mount namespace, I guess, where you say uh, if you have incoming mounts from mount propagation, then uh, mark them as read only or mark them as node f and so on, and that adds ever more magic into mount propagation as it is, and it's. Really, I think the complexity level that we reached there is already hard enough with MS shared, MS slave, MS shared and slave, and peer group IDs and whatever we have. Like the mount propagation algorithm is horrifying to look at. Uh, so I'm generally against ex extending it. It sounds like some magic. Okay, we have some special mount namespace, which is probably the initial but mount namespace that has these mounts read write, and then but then we propagate into some. So Less privileged mount namespace that somehow ors into my, magic flags. So, so my my uh, implementation uh, implementation idea, not being a kernel guy, uh, was the assumption that we could attach to any mount a mask of stuff that is implicitly applied to all bind mounts added yeah, below that mount. So it would not be about namespaces, not at all. It would re really just be a mask that you can specify on a mount. Um, that is applied to whatever is uh, added below. I think that would be relatively yeah, simple. Yeah, we talked about the mask idea. That that's kind of that's kind of diff. Maybe if you only had read only, that would somehow work because then you you know you, there there is no complex calculating of what mount flags uh, you uh, yeah what mount flags you actually need if you add ms node f in there and ms no exec and so on things could get become uh, could become a um, a bit more hairy. I also don't know if this actually. So the idea being you mount on top of a mount, uh, and that mount that you created, like how, you need to mark the mount. How do you mark the mount as like having an implicit mask? Like you can just set it with Serata, like you would, it would have like a special, like a, another, like rather than having, uh, rather than setting the attributes of the mount, you would have like a different attribute which is like, oh, this is the attribute of mask. So yeah. Well, that's, that's what I would assume would be like the yeah, that's what simplest way of doing it. And then you mount on top of the you mount on top of a target mount, and you start propagating, and then that in, like propagates these mount flags to all of the clones yes. that it creates for the other names. <laughs> it's, it's so disgusting. <laughs> so to the, 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 the attribute would be set on the on um, inside the target namespace, not on the host. So it'd be like in, when they set up the namespace for the service, so it's a then they. 
Well, no, 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 but it, 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 it's set on the mount. It would, it's set on the mount in the namespace. Yep. So, like, when, when, the, be, when the propagation, I mean, I'm sure this is horrific, but when the propagation happens and it gets attached to the thing, the, the mount that's underneath it's getting attached to, that's where the thing would apply. See, Alexa gets me. So, so like, when you say on top of, do you mean, like, A slash B? So the mount, when, when, it, when it's propagated underneath, so when you have, like, slash media, right, inside the namespace slash media would have, a, would have an attribute set with mount data, which says, for any mount that happens underneath this thing, so it's attached as a child of this mount, that it will have this thing automatically applied as a, whenever you mount to it. And so when propagation happens, it would also have it applied, is what he's suggesting, I mean, what he's suggesting as, as far as I understand. <laughs> it's a weird but, way to implement. That's a weird way to implement it. Like, like you could, okay. You then you still, but so when you create another mount namespace, you create a second mount namespace. That implicitly, what the kernel implicitly does, uh, not implicitly, what the kernel does, like it copies all of the mounts from the originating uh, mount namespace, and then they just magically appear. How do you mark the slash media mount? Like the same way as we turn on the, like we set everything to slave, MS slave, and my assumption would be this at the same time where we set everything to MS slave, we would also set this extra mask that is then further enforced on anything that is propagated under these. So these you things. need to explicitly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, add, we add recursive, like the use space would do it. It's opt-in. And any mount that you then propagate on top of this uh, would also inherit the, the restriction flag. And then if you have, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, unwinding a bit, I think the landlock idea is actually quite yeah, good I for mean, this. Yeah, it kind of feels weird, right? Like that we have two levels of, of the same policy. Sure. One is using one way. But, but we should use completely I, weird. I'm way. pretty sure. Mac also Mac also prevents you from unmounting. Uh, prevent you from you can use, for example, App Armor to uh, prevent you from uh, uh, unmounting a mount you would be otherwise able to unmount. For me, this is like mandatory access uh, control territory, not something the VFS should like take care about. Well, so, like mean, we do stuff, for example, uh, we do stuff. Of, of course, when you're like. Uh, you have a read-only mount, and you propagate that read-only mount into a mount namespace. That mount namespace now is privileged over that mount. Yeah, you lock the read-only flag to make sure that the mount namespace cannot suddenly turn that into a read-write mount. Totally, yes, because that's a security issue. But, but this, is, this is essentially like you're propagating a read-write mount, and you're propagating it into all of the other uh, uh, namespaces. It's exactly what you do. It's not, a, it's not per se an attack vector or a security, a security issue. And if you want additional mandatory control, mandatory access control. So uh, the thing is, like, like in systemd, we actually have read-only path, and then we have inaccessible pass. And what inaccessible pass, like the setting does, it actually overmounts a thing either with an uh, um, empty file or, or with an empty directory that is immutable. Hmm? Yeah, it could be a device node, like a zero out one. But um, uh, 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 so, I mean, for, for these things, landlock isn't an answer, right? Um, because uh, landlock cannot make file disappear, right? Like one is about visibility, the other one is about um, uh, access. Um, right now, the sandboxing where I have mount namespaces kind of gives us both. Even but of course, landlock can ne never cover the, if the visibility you overmount, thing. But for example, if you overmount, uh, you need at least, uh, you need a second mount namespace that is not owned by uh, whatever process is in there, so they can't just unmount whatever you... Sure, uh, I mean, yeah. It's, it's not not a solution on its own. If you if the client has privileges, they can undo things. I'm fully aware of this. I mean, if you propagate it into there, then they become locked and they can't unmount it. Well, if you use name user namespaces. No, 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 not if you propagate it. If you, you are, you you would need to. If you. Uh, if you overmount and then create an unprivileged uh, mount namespace, uh, and then they get copied yeah. as a stack and they're glued together, that's yeah. yeah. I mean, you need to use user and as into the mix. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but um, or drop privileges. That's probably enough. I don't know. Let's uh, talk about something else. If uh, there's interest. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I think kind of already mentioned this asynchronous close. Um, kind of big big problem for us. Um, I already mentioned the attack to this. Um, I think IOU ring, like uh, Jens kind of suggested that you can use IOU ring for this. In systemd, 
it is actually a big problem for us because we maintain per service like this thing we call the FD store so that the services can send us an FD and we keep it for them and then uh, they stick around and then sometimes the service goes down and now we have to close all the files in the FD store and then uh, we could freeze. So uh, our way around it is uh, we know that threads are relatively cheap on Linux and uh, 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 do, like we can kill them anytime. So what we do is we, we uh, buy us this is a current behavior by wasting threads. So uh, we fork off a little process that the only thing it does is call close. Um, and then it might hang for 15 seconds or longer if this is a weird NFS, FD, or whatever. Um, it's a uh, it's half a solution, right? Like, because uh, it basically means, you know what I really, really don't like about this thing is, is if we destruct, stu destruct stuff, right, which is like service stop is a destruction, um, we end up allocating new resources, like a new thread. Um, uh, and there are relatively low limits on things, right? Like our limit and proc and, and things like that. So uh, a, a, a destruction process that ends up allocating things um, from a set of resources that is relatively limited, I really don't like this, right? So the current uh, code path is even that we try to fork something off, and if we can't fork off that thread, we actually fall back to a regular uh, synchronous close. Um, yeah, Jan says I Uring can give us that. I don't really know how that's all. Uh, yeah, I don't properly understand why that wouldn't cost us memory instead of threads, which isn't that much better. But um, uh, I don't know. I think it should be something that we can. It's a security issue to some point, right? Um, uh, I think we really should. But also have a resource this. issue. I mean, as you said, the if you are out of memory and the room killer is killing a service and then we kill your service and then we start spawning new things and take more memory. That's kind of icky. So yeah, it's not just security, even resources. Yeah, I mean, it's ultimately it's a resource issue, but I think it's a, a security resource yeah. issue. Like that, it's a, a, and the resource issue that easily turns into a security uh, issue, like a DOS thing at least. Um, I don't know. I think it's not entirely trivial to implement this because uh, in on kernel side, uh, there's something. Problem. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe we can find some solution to this. Did you get any more details on the IO Uring solution other than use oh, IO? Oh, uh, Jens texted me, like we, I talked about this with him at a, some, some conference and uh, he told me lots of things and uh, uh, I did not quite understand why submitting one of these uh, requests into the IO Uring wouldn't take memory because that basically means, um, yeah, you trade again uh, 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 memory against uh, another resource, um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure he knows what he's saying. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't think that's an unavoidable, right? Because like, no matter as like asynchronously, something's going to have to be allocated to like wait around for those resources to be reclaimed, right? And like, well, I, you know, from my perspective, I don't really care what happens to the stuff that's behind it. I really care about that the file descriptors are released, right? Like, right? Which are two different things, and I think it should be possible somehow. I don't know. Well, so like, I, I'm not saying that or. I, you know, it's also a concept of ownership, right? Like, um, in, in the world that I live in, people send us file descriptors all the time. It really sucks that I have to pay the, the waiting time for closing it instead of the actual owner of the file descriptor, right? Like, this is like, to me, um, the, the resource ownership is kind of turned around there because I'm the unlucky one who ended up being the one who actually closed the shit. I have to pay the penalty for it. So I kind of have the suspicion this should be, like, we should be, we should be tougher on tracking resources to the owners that created them and kind of make them pay for them. I don't know how that could work for close, but it's it's like a fundamental issue I see here. That if the, the, original owner of that, the original owner of that file could be long gone and you're the only one holding a reference to that. And the only thing that we can do if what you mean by asynchronously in the in the naive sense would probably you close and it, it, it immediately like mount detach, it immediately returns and then it's sort of the, the kernel's problem. But that means essentially we leak it to some K thread or something that potentially yeah. blocks forever. I uh, mean, that, that would be global cure or something where you have file descriptors that you just try to close yeah. and close and close and close. Right, and th that's what I'm saying is like, you know, I think that the IO ring thing is the solution because like that's what you just described is exactly what will happen. I'll get offloaded to a K thread that's going to sit there forever. And th but the other thing is like, I, I understand that you feel like it's annoying that system B is responsible for this, but like where I see this often is a n spawn client 
has an open FD. And so yes, okay, the client inside is responsible, but like ultimately the whole package is responsible. So like you're being penalized, but like you're also the client, you're the one who has the thing open because you're the con container well, management. Yeah, you know, like, uh, I mean, we can just say basically that multi-user systems, everything's fucked anyway, right? right. <laughs> um, and I guess that's true, right? Like, if, if we have nicely sealed systems where we just pass stuff into, but never never have two two way communication, passing resources around. So yeah, I can I can agree with that. But still, I think it's something we need to be doing about because the original uh, model of of security in Linux is around users, and right now we're not protecting users in this regard. And like, and I think it's a major way right. um, uh, how we're not protecting users against each other. It's, For sure. For the most part, most file systems don't block you much when you're closing, right? You know, it's mostly just, well, NFS is the big one, right? You know, because the, it wants to do CTO. So, uh, so we, we have to flush all the dirty data uh, when closing a file so we can hold on to the attributes right. But most of the time, I, I wouldn't think this would be a huge problem on most file systems, you know? I mean, it might even be nice to at least have half a solution. Like, for example, for the TP, TCP thing, I really, like, I don't know if it just closes it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Or maybe we can actually, make sure the TCP thing, we could just figure out if it's a TCP socket, then turn off lingering and then close it or something like this, because you can do this. But Jesus, if we now for every special subsystem that gives us an FD, we'd have to add these hacks that says, uh, oh, please do not wait for whatever the fuck you're doing there. Then uh, I don't know. But then really just have a, a, a <clears throat> have like a little system D daemon. <laughs> uh, that, uh, no, I'm joking, but you have an IO Euring instance uh, uh, somewhere where you can offload uh, that stuff into. Uh, and then you so can also, the other thing that the other advantage is like, <clears throat> or advantage, depends on how you look at it. If you have an asynchronous close, and uh, then you have no way to figure out like what file descriptors, for example, are still hanging around and are still blocking you. So for example, you if you try to mount something again, but for some reason, uh, something was fucked, uh, and that uh, that there's a file that still pins that file system, you now wouldn't be able to mount it, and you get that annoying e, e busy thingy. But you have no way of figuring out what is actually uh, still keeping that busy because it's hanging in some k-thread in the kernel that you have. Not even the kernel probably knows what is in there. So the, the, the with with um, with IO Uring, you have the ability to go and uh, inspect like you know what FDs are still in there, what is still hanging in there. Do I? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, isn't it a little bit tougher request telling everybody, oh, keep a Uring around where you can insert FDs to close? I don't I know. Mean, why everyone? No, it's not, not everyone, it's you. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine with me. <laughs> so, you know, to, to resolve the, you know, this little DNS uh, 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 um, implementation that we have in systemd, we actually called, added something that we call the FD graveyard, like the socket graveyard, because we have this problem that, that uh, if we close two, um, uh, eagerly, all the file descriptors, um, then uh, all the communication that might still come in from a DNS server will result in a in a in a packet bag that the port is closed, right? So we already have this little uh, thing that it just keeps FDs around for a while, <laughs> um, because otherwise the kernel would do shit. I don't know, like. It would be good, like, maybe we can have a per subsystem way how we can basically say, um, this FD I don't care about, and then we turn all the, 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 the Like a forced shutdown. Or... Yeah, and then uh, if, if subsystems implement this, great. If they don't, they're not. I don't know. So close two with flags. Yeah, because like I have the suspicion that many of these behaviors, if it's I really a, don't care if about. it's a file system specific problem, like for example with with uh, with NFS, and you know you could make an NFS mount option. <laughs> yeah, there already is there already is one. I mean, you can turn off CTO if you really want. You know. Yeah, but nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to do that, yeah. and they should. <laughs> it's like a terrible <laughs> idea. Like, don't do that. <laughs> so. Oh, and then there's unprivileged fuse, by the way, which which just blows everything completely up. Well, I, the nice thing about that is Joanne's working on um, timeouts for connections, so hopefully that'll help in that regard, right? Well, the, I mean, the, the, for the for my example, there are no connections anymore. Right, right, right. So, like closing the connection on a fuse should be relatively straightforward. Like, it, there's not a lot. I mean, it has to clean up any outstanding requests, but it's not going to be like NFS where it just fucks off forever. Sorry, goes away forever. <laughs> 
Anyway, so um, I don't think we'll solve this problem here, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but I just, uh, at least at the very least, I got you all to maybe think about this or something. There's some. Um, maybe you could make uh, async close fail on subsystems that don't implement it and then fall back to what you currently have. And over time, subsystems that can do this easily or in a reasonable way can start implementing async close. So, I mean, I sympathize with that thing, but I have no illusions like this is my problem and it's very hard to convince all the subsystem maintainers that uh, uh, they should care about my problems. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I don't like this. It's Divas Demon's problem. It's my problem. It's basically everybody who accepts FDs in a, in a somewhat generic fashion, not knowing what it is. Um, and I think it's, it's probably you can exploit a lot of other demons with this um, because uh, uh, um, yeah, everybody does IPC and uses rec for message and people are not aware of the problem at all. Um, uh, I kind of find it sad that nobody actually spent some, some security research time into exploiting demons like this. But I guess nobody cares about local exploits like this anymore anyway. But um, I don't know, maybe let's talk about another thing before. Five like, minutes. Five minutes. Five more minutes. Oh, which one? If we're going to be lost in line. Yeah. Clock monotonic on network timestamps. So uh, there's uh, like they're, they're networking timestamps and they use the real time clock and I think it's really weird that they do this. They should really get us the monotonic timestamp instead. Um, because uh, like yeah, and in system we use it for so many things. Like for example, for logging. Uh, because we usually just care about the monotonic one, not the real time, because uh, who the fuck cares about calendar time when they look at, I mean, okay, there's NTP that cares, but other than NTP, nobody cares about calendar time. Um, uh, so uh, it's kind of nasty because it would basically mean duplicating all the sock ops that they have, and they have so many already because they support. M it would only have to be one. Like he, uh, you wouldn't do it in the in the uh, microsecond based one, and you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily. No, wait. Yeah, is it? Uh, you, like we have three main interfaces, and then we have the versions for 32 and 64-bit time. You would only have to add one thing, and we already have the with the SO time stamping. We have the option for device hardware timestamps, so we might be able to fit it in there. I would love this. Like, we, it's so useful for us because, like, for example, for logging, we now synthesize that on the receiving side, and that basically means when the system is loaded, everything goes to, like, the, the timestamps yep. become completely unreliable. Um, so, do you, do you want the timestamps mainly for actual network devices or for the Unix domain sockets? Like, uh, in this case, it's Unix domain sockets. Because. So I, I'm not sure how the hardware timestamps are defined, but if they don't have to be related to actual uh, real time, then we could just pretend that the hardware timestamps for domain sockets are clock monotonic, and we, would, we wouldn't have to extend any API. I don't know if this works, but... That's, that would be my idea. <laughs> I, I would love that. Like, it's, it, it's really like, we use this for many things because, like, you know, uh, when we log, uh, uh, we, like, the interesting, the most interesting logs are always early boot logs where we really have no correct clock. And hence, yep. yeah, we get this information that is really useless. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd rather have something else. Um, so everybody agrees this is something we want. Um, and uh, <laughs> now we just need to find people to actually implement this. Mm. We still have a couple of minutes left. Immutable loopback devices. I mean, it's more like a bug, I think. And uh, um, Christoph actually accepted that this is really stupid. But on Linux, uh, uh, no matter what you do, loopback block devices are not immutable. Uh, even if you ask them to read early, it's, it's, it's really, it took like uh, uh, a couple of days out of my life um, figuring that out. So if you have a file system that uh, uh, maintains like a, like a dirty flag, um, uh, uh, you mount it from a loopback device where the uh, uh, loopback device is read only and the file system behind it is read only, it still will write through the, the, the change, like the, the dirty flag and things like this. Um, and uh, uh, it's terrible uh, because uh, uh, this, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's incredible, right? Like because you would assume that if you if you if you mount a thing read only on every layer, um, then uh, uh, nothing would happen. But uh, yeah, so the only way, like, 
the the uh, kernel file system people uh, now accepted that no recovery is the flag that you have to set to actually get read-only behavior, but it really sucks that you have to give that to flag to the file system people instead of that this is an enforced on the block layer already. Um, so uh, uh, I think Christoph accepted this, um, that this is an issue that we should fix, and he even looked into fixing it, but uh, apparently something relies <laughs> <laughs> that shit, then it actually go, ends up on the on the disk in the end. So um, I don't know. It's it's very annoying. Um, Any comment on this one thing? But yeah, and then we make use of this because, like in in systemd, we have this this concept called DDIs, discoverable disk images, that we like for security reasons. We want to like always have these file systems that we mount and then run everything off. But uh, this all falls flat if these things are that are supposed to be immutable are not immutable anymore uh, <laughs> because if we mount them, everything changes and uh, all the reproducibility goes out of the window because the hashes of everything change just because you looked at them. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, I think this, uh, our time more than over now. Uh, thank you very much for all your interest. Um, uh, for all the rest, go to the website.